All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Bob Stiegel. Uh, I'm here this morning to talk about some code that I wrote for doing fast conversion from UTF-8 uh, using C++ and uh, a DFA, and for the ultimate in speed, some SSE intrinsics. Uh, C++ is actually not the star of this show. Uh, the C++ that you'll see in here is actually quite simple and is in fact trivially and mechanically translatable to C. This could be done with any C++ 98 compiler, as long as the inliner is good. Uh, there's nothing very fancy about it. In fact, the only thing really that makes it C++ is that I use a, a traits class style construction with, with uh, static, uh, static member functions to, to wrap it all together and uh, make it into a nice package. Um, you know, I thought that when I pitched this talk uh, to the program committee, I thought it made sort of a nice fishing story. You know, I went and I got lucky and I caught this big fish using some, some simple C++ and thinking about the problem slightly differently than other people have thought about it in the past. So, I'd like to start the talk with some definitions I think you'll need to know to understand uh, the meat of the talk and really the things you really need to understand are code unit and code point and what those mean. There's some other definitions I'll give that put some context around those two terms. I want to talk a little bit about what UTF-8 is. Then I want to take a step aside and talk briefly about what a DFA is. Probably everybody in this room knows what that is. And then I'm going to talk about, in general terms, how one recognizes a valid UTF-8 sequence using a DFA. Finally, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time uh, talking about the converter that I wrote. Uh, I'm not sure that converter is actually the correct term, but it's, it's code that I wrote that takes UTF-8 and transcodes it to UTF-16 or, or to UTF-32. I'm going to then show you several graphs of performance measurements of the speed of my code versus several other libraries, which I think are sort of recognized as being standards in a way, or standard solutions that other people use, or common solutions. Uh, finally, there's a caveat I'd like to make. I am not a Unicode expert by any stretch of the imagination. If you ask me a complicated Unicode question, I am going to roll out, I am going to throw Zach here under the bus because <laughs> Zach knows a lot more about it than I do. <laughs> so, so there's like a, a triple or quadruple indirection that's going to go on here. Okay. Uh, I started looking at this problem because I was looking at something else. And uh, I ran into this thing called UTF-8, and it needed to be turned into UTF-32. I didn't know what it was. I looked, did some research at it, and I thought, oh, this is kind of an interesting problem. I wrote some trivial code to do it, and it was very slow, and I thought, maybe there's a way to make it faster. So to me, it was just an algorithms problem. How can I take some sequence of, of bytes and turn it into a sequence of 32-bit <coughs> words by following certain rules? And really, I don't even care about the rules. I'm more interested in the, in the process uh, of following the rules and making it as quick as possible. All right, so some definitions. Code unit. A code unit is like an atom. It's a single indivisible integral unit of an encoded sequence of characters. And a sequence of one or more code units uh, makes up a code point. And it's not a very good analogy, but you can think of a code point as being a molecule. You put hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms together, and you get water molecules, and it's the water molecule that you're interested in. The code point is what we're really interested in, because a code point ultimately is used to represent a character, or a glyph, when, it's, when a character is rendered into some physical form. By itself, a code unit doesn't really identify a particular character or any code point. It's it's an atom. Like a hydrogen atom, you can put it together with lots of different things and make lots of different molecules out of it. The meaning of a particular code unit value is derived from something called an encoding, and we'll see what an encoding is in a minute. In C++11, uh, these are some types that are commonly used to represent code units. char, uint8 underscore t, wcart, char16t, and char32t. These are all integer types which in C++ are used to represent code units in varying kinds of, of uh, transformations or encodings. 
So an encoding. An encoding is a way of representing a sequence of characters, language characters, as a sequence of code unit subsequences. So if I have a character and that character is represented by a code point and that code point is represented by a sequence of code units, I have a sequence of characters which ultimately is a sequence of sequences of code, of code units. Uh, encodings can be stateless or stateful. Uh, a stateful encoding is one in which as you are encoding the stream of code units, the encoding you do right now depends on some encoding you did previously. And of course a stateless encoding is one in which uh, your current actions that you take do not depend on past actions that you take. An encoding can be fixed width or it can be variable width. Uh, UTF-32 is a fixed width encoding. UTF-8 is a variable width encoding. Yes, Alistair. I clarify when, when you mean by characters. Characters as a more fixed width code unit or are we talking about characters that might be combinations of multiple code units, not code units, code points, sorry, or multiple code points could form? To be defined. Context. To be defined in, in coming slides. Uh, encodings can be bidirectional. Uh, for example, you could have uh, situations where you are mixing, uh, say, right to left and left to right scripts in strings. Uh, they can be random access. Uh, you're probably familiar with all of these kinds of encodings, UTF-8, 16, and 32, ISO IEC 8859, and Windows code page 1252. So, code point. A code point is an integer value that denotes an abstract character as defined by a character set. And, and uh, we'll come to what a character set is in a moment. A code point by itself doesn't identify a particular character. The meaning of a code point is derived from a character set definition. Uh, in, in a minute we'll see there's sort of a circular set of definitions here. So in C++, char and wchart, char16t, and char32t are also commonly used code point types for various encodings. And whether a type is a code unit or a code point depends on the encoding and the usage. So a character set is a mapping of code point values to abstract characters, the, the, the things of which languages are composed. A character set doesn't need to provide a mapping for every possible code point value represented by the code point type. A char32 has 32 bits of information in it, but the English language only needs, I don't know, less than 128 to represent pretty much everything you need to do. Uh, so, in terms of character sets, ASCII is a character set, Windows code page 1252 is a character set, Unicode defines a, uh, a character set, a very large character set. And finally, we come to character, which is an element of a written language, for example, a letter, a number, <coughs> or a symbol of some sort. For our purposes, the purposes of this talk, a character is identified by a combination of a character set and a code point value. So if the character set, uh, if the character set is an array of code points, the character is the value that exists in a particular element in that array. And just like arrays, things can move around inside the array. The letter A doesn't need to be at location, you know, hex 32. It could be somewhere else in a different encoding. So we have the idea of character, character set, and uh, encoding. Now, for the purposes of this algorithm and this talk, I don't really care about that stuff. I'm purely interested in converting UTF-8 code units into UTF-32 code points. Alistair. So I'm wondering where this fits with things like uh, combining characters that say, put this accent on the, the, the next character I give you. Beyond the scope of this talk, okay. I will I will indirect to Zach, who will, who will indirect to Peter.
It's because the code points that are not characters when you when you go through as far as right. this talk is concerned. Right. Uh, ISO 10646. This is an international standard that defines what is called the universal character set. Uh, UCS is a or UCS. It's a superset of all known character set or commonly used character set standards. Uh, 10646 assigns a position and a name to every character in all of the, the tables that it maintains, and it guarantees lossless round-trip compatibility with other standards. How it does that, I don't know. <laughs> Beyond the scope of this talk. You may have heard of something called the Basic Multilingual Plane, or the BMP. So, in Unicode, every 2 to the 16th subset of code points, beginning at code point 0, is called a plane. So you have 65, 536 code points beginning at 0 to 65, 535, 65, 536 to 131, 071, and so on and so forth. Each one of those 64K code points is called a plane. The first such plane from code point zero to FFFF is called the basic multilingual plane or a lot of people also call it plane zero. Most characters for most languages are actually mapped into that plane. When you go outside of that plane there are extended and rare characters uh, and I can't really tell you much more than that. Uh, but uh, there are things like CJK, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Their the, uh, the what's that called, Zach? The CJ, the comma, the universal CJK, or you know what I'm talking about? The CJK. All of those characters exist <laughs> inside plane zero. So, as I said, the most commonly used characters from older standards appear in the BMP, and and. Uh, the things that are in the BMP are actually what were originally in the very first Unicode standard 25 or more years ago. Uh, the Unicode consortium has declared that only the first 17 planes will be used, which means that now and forever, allegedly, all code points will exist from 0 to hex 10 FFFF. And that gives 1,114,112 code points. So, Unicode is an international standard from the Unicode Consortium. All characters have the, uh, in Unicode have the same names and positions as in ISO 10646. Uh, Unicode defines semantics associated with subsets of those characters. UTF is the Unicode transformation format. And UTF 8, 16, and 32 are three standardized transformation defined by the Unicode consortium that use 8-bit, 16-bit, and 32-bit code units. <coughs> so you may ask, reasonably, what's the difference between ISO 10646 and Unicode? Well, as I said before, 10646 is mostly a character set table that uh, assigns names and positions to characters. Unicode does that and more. It specifies, out, for example, algorithms for how to render certain sets of characters, algorithms for handling uh, bidirectional text that may include mixes of, say, Hebrew and Latin characters, algorithms for string searching and comparison, and, of course, the algorithms for the transformation formats. Good, we got through the definitions. Okay, so what is UTF-8? UTF-8 is a variable length scheme for encoding code points. Every code point is encoded by a sequence of one to four code units of an 8-bit unsigned integer type. And they could be uint8t or unsigned char. Throughout this talk, I will call them code units. I may also slip and refer to them as bytes or octets. The first byte in a sequence, in a valid UTF-8 sequence, indicates or determines the total length of that sequence. So, for example, ASCII characters are encoded from hex 0 to hex 7f. The first byte in a multi-byte sequence 
always will lie in the range of hex C2 to hex F4. Trailing bytes in a multi-byte sequence, those bytes that come after the first byte in a multi-byte sequence, will always lie on the range hex 80 to hex BF. So it sounds, it's a lot to absorb, and the way to think about it, at least the way that helped me when I was trying to understand this, is to think about, rather than think about bytes, think about bits and how bits are laid out in the bytes. So let's take a sequence, a one byte sequence, an ASCII sequence. An ASCII sequence of bytes will always have a leading zero in the first byte. That gives us seven trailing bits in that byte of useful information. So we can encode characters whose code point values lie on the range zero to seven F, the ASCII characters. In a two byte sequence, the first character in the byte, or the first bits, in the first byte will always begin with 110. There are two ones followed by a zero which indicate that this sequence is two bytes long. Now, we also need a way to indicate trailing bytes. Trailing bytes are always indicated by a one and a zero in the, in the high bit positions. So, I'm using three bits at the top of my first byte and two bits at the top of my second byte that gives me a total of 11 bits of information that I can use, which means uh, my leading, so yes, I have 11 bits of information I can use, and if you look at this, if you look at this byte, that means the value of this byte can be anything from C2 to hex DF. Now you may be asking, why not C0 or C1? We'll come to that in a moment. For a three byte sequence, the first byte in the, in the three byte sequence begins with three ones in a zero in the high order bits. And the trailing bytes follow the same rules. So if you count the number of X's there, you have 16 bits of usable information. And the pattern continues for a four, four byte sequence. The, the upper five bits in the four byte sequence are one, 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 zero, which indicates I have four bytes in the sequence and the trailing bytes are all the same. So let's look at some examples of valid sequences. Here's a one byte sequence. The upper bit in my, in my byte is a zero which indicates this is ASCII. I use the lower seven bits and it, it turns out to be hex 7D which is the closing brace which is John Kalb's favorite feature in C++. <laughs> All right, let's look at another sequence. Our code point is hex A9, which is encoded as C2 and A9, which turns out to be the copyright symbol. So, A9, 1010 is A, 1001 is 9. That's how those bits for that code point are encoded into those two bytes. Does that make sense? Okay, in the absence of, of <coughs> complaints, I will think that it does. Similarly, for a larger code sequence, hex 2260, which corresponds to the not equal mathematical symbol. If you follow this nibble and this nibble, and this nibble, and this nibble, you'll get 2260. 2, 2, I'm sorry, 2, 6, and 0. So I've taken the bits from these two bytes and I've spread them out across three bytes according to the rules of the encoding or the rules of the transformation. Okay, so now we run into this problem of what's called overlong sequences. The Unicode transformation rules state that an encoding of a code point to code units must use the, the shortest possible encoding, the, sh the shortest possible sequence. <coughs> so let's consider again John's favorite C++ feature, the closing brace, the ASCII character hex 7D, and it uses all seven bits of its representation. So 
we look at this and say this is a valid ASCII leading byte, and in fact it's the only byte in a one byte sequence. But we could also take this same set of bits and we could encode it into a two byte sequence. Here I've taken these seven bits and I've encoded them into this two byte 16 bit sequence. Well, what's the problem here? The problem is I have seven bits, I'm using seven bits in a sequence that can hold 11 bits, and I have a valid container for seven bits in a one byte sequence. So I'm actually in effect, zero padding the representation of the code point with these extra zeros in a multi-byte sequence. I can represent these seven bits in a single byte, but by trying to represent the same seven bits in two bytes, I'm breaking the rules. This is an invalid sequence called an overlong sequence. And you could extend this to three and four bytes. Again, here I'm representing a I only need seven bits of information, but I'm representing it in a sequence that can hold 16 bits. Again, I'm breaking the, the Unicode transformation rules. Okay, so boundary conditions. There are boundary conditions on the problem. These are the rules that I talked about before. Well, we already know what the maximum possible code point value is. It's 10 FFFF, or corresponding to 17 planes of 2 to the 16th code points per plane. In the middle there is this thing called the UTF-16 surrogates, which range from hex D800 to hex DFFF. And that range is divided into two range, the leading or the high surrogates, what are called the leading or the high surrogates, and what are called the leading or the low surrogates. These are used in UTF-16 encodings to represent the leading or trailing code unit in a sequence of paired UTF-16 code units. So you could have a UTF-32 code point which is encoded in two UTF-16 code units. And if one of those code units, it's possible that one of those code units could lie in this range. So from our perspective, from UTF-8, the rules of UTF-8 dictate that these uh, encodings in this range should never occur in UTF-8 sequences. So there is no such thing as a code point which in and of itself has the value hex DC-100. That's an invalid code point. And a, a UTF-8 sequence of code units derived from that code point is an invalid sequence. So there's this range of code point values which are verboten when doing UTF-8 encodings. Oops, the wrong button. And also, we just saw the overlong sequences. So two-byte overlong sequences will always begin with the byte C0 or C1. If the, byte, if the leading byte is C0 or C1, that means I'm only using seven bits of I'm using seven bits of information in a two-byte sequence, and the sequence is therefore overlong. That's why two-byte sequences always begin with C2. And three-byte sequences, if the leading byte is E0 and it's followed by any byte that's greater than or equal to 9F, that's overlong. And if it's a four-byte sequence that begins with F0, followed by any byte greater than 8F, it's also overlong. So these form rules that we need to, we're going to need to look at when we construct the DFA that we're going to use to do the decoding. So what does a sample converter look like? Well, this is sort of the canonical, simple example of how one might write a converter. We've got uh, We've got a, a pointer to an input buffer. We've got the, the variable representing the code point we're going to use as an out variable. And what we do is we start at the top. We look and see, is this an ASCII? Is this code unit represent an ASCII code point? If so, we'll assign it to the code unit. Uh, our number of code units is one. Uh, we'll fall down and we'll check it. In this case, that ought to be okay. Otherwise, if 
it begins with 110, which is what this expression gets you. If the, leading, the upper bytes in the first byte are 110, it's a two-byte sequence. We're going, to, uh, we're going to take bits and we're going to use them from that, uh, from the two bytes, and we're going to use them to construct those bits and do some shifting and masking operations to put them into the code point. And similarly for three and four byte sequences. And then this little function check here which I wrote is something which is intended to determine whether or not the code point that you've just found is valid. So if you get a code point for the closing brace, hex 7D, but the number of code units used to do that encoding was three, you know that it was an invalid sequence. This is not the code that we're going to be using. All right. We'll take a step back and think about what is a DFA. So a DFA stands for Deterministic Finite Automaton. It's a finite state machine that it can accept or reject strings of symbols. It recognizes regular languages and it's useful for pattern matching. It's defined mathematically by a finite number of states, a finite set of input symbols, a transition function, a start state, and one or more accept states. How does it work? Well, given the current state and a pending input symbol, which is called the look ahead, the transition function specifies the next state. So you begin at the start state, you consume symbols, and undergo state transition until your recognizer halts. And your recognition halts when you reach an accept state or there is no transition that leaves the state, in which case you reject the string. DFAs are relatively limited in the languages that they can recognize. They can recognize simple regular expressions, very simple regular expressions, uh, concatenation, clean closure, positive closure, conditional closure, or alternation. They cannot solve problems that require more than constant space, such as matching properly paired sets of parentheses. So let's look at a very simple DFA to recognize a, a, an integer. So it's a very simple integer. There can be zero or more leading space characters, followed by an optional plus or minus sign, followed by one or more digits. And I'm going to allow leading zeros in this. So very simple. I start out in state zero. As long as I am acquiring spaces through the look ahead, I stay in state zero. If I acquire a digit, I come over here and I'm in the accept state. And I'm going to keep consuming characters. If I find another digit, I'm in the accept state. Once I'm done, consuming, once I no longer have digits, I'm done. I've recognized a string. If I find a sign, that's great. And if the next, if the next uh, look ahead symbol is a digit, I can go into the digit state and again loop. If those things don't occur, then I'm going to reject the string. And how would I represent this in a program? Well, typically with a table. I have some states and I have inputs. So if I'm in state 0 and I get a digit, I can jump to state 2. If I'm in state 2, as long as I keep getting digits, I stay in state 2. If I get anything else, I can accept. If I'm in state 0 and I get a sign, I jump to state 1. If I'm in state 1 and I get 2s, I, I get a digit, then I can jump into state 2, and so on. If I'm in state 0 or state 1, or say if I'm in state one, the sign state, and I get a sign or a space or anything else, I reject the string. If I'm in state zero, and I get anything other than a space, a sign, or a digit, I reject the string. So how can we use a DFA to recognize UTF-8? Well, as a reminder, we've got these boundary conditions. These are the rules that need to be followed. I'm not going to explain this table, but I've included it here as a tool for reasoning about this and how one finds the transitions. There's actually two slides here. I started by ordering the code points in hex and binary, and then finding what their encodings would be in UTF-8 in hex and binary, and looking for those interstices which represent the boundary conditions. Here are overlong two-byte sequences, overlong three-byte sequences, Here's where the surrogates go. And everywhere you see a red line, 
that represents a boundary condition where state, a state transition has to be created to cover that boundary condition. At the upper end of the spectrum with the three and four byte sequences, I've repeated the surrogates at the top here. Uh, here are four byte overlong sequences and finally here are sequences for bytes that exceed the upper limit. So when all is said and done, here's what the DFA looks like. It has nine states uh, with the begin state. We have transition over to continuation state one, which is for a two-byte sequence in this case. We have state transitions for three and for four-byte sequences of bytes. And each edge on this graph is labeled with the range of bytes in which, which caused that transition to occur. If you are in any state and any byte occurs in that state which doesn't, isn't covered by the range uh, of, of bytes on its outgoing transitions, that's an implicit transition into the error state. So the edges that you see on this graph are the non-error edges. Every other edge leads to the error state. So how could we use this to do it a recognition? Let's say we have a three byte sequence, E2, 8, 8, and 8, 5. Our look ahead is pointing at E2, so we're in the begin state. E2 is in the range on this edge, which means looks like we're going to move into continuation state 2. We consume the character, we move into continuation state 2. Our next byte in the look ahead is 8, 8, which fits in our range for an outgoing transition. So we're going to transition to continuation state 1. We have 8, 5, which is in the range for the outgoing transition and we go back to the begin state, which is also the end state, the accepting state in this, in this DFA. Done. We've just recognized a three-byte sequence. Any questions so far? Okay. So, how does my converter work? Well, the idea was that I wanted to implement UTF recognition and decoding using a DFA rather than chained set of if statements. And I wanted that DFA to decode while recognition was occurring. I wanted to pre-compute as much as possible as long as the table lookups didn't actually cause performance to, to decrease. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes if everything's in a register and you can do bitwise operation with registers, it's faster than getting something from memory. But I also wanted to keep the lookup tables small. <coughs> I wanted to keep the code as simple as possible, but also make it fast and of course, by keeping the code simple, I hope to hide the complexity of the problem of doing the recognition in the DFA. Finally, I want it to be faster than the other guys. So, I'm going to show you the interface and there are some assumptions here. My pointer arguments are non-null. There's no error checking in this at all. This is to prove a point, not to write something that's production quality. My pointer arguments are non-null. I assume that my input and output buffers actually exist. I assume that my destination buffer is big enough to receive all of my output without having to check for that. I'm going to assume, because I'm working on Intel architecture, that my code points and code units are little endian. I'm going to assume that I've got x86 or x64 hardware and the SSE2 instruction set is available, SSE2 or higher. I'm going to assume when I'm decoding to uh, UTF-32 code points that my destination array is aligned on a char-32 boundary and for transcoding to UTF-16 that my destination buffer is aligned on a char-16 boundary. So things are wrapped up in a trait style class with static member functions. We're really going to concentrate on these three, the three different algorithms that I've implemented, basic convert, fast convert, and SSE convert. And they all sort of file the STL uh, stood copy uh, uh, argument pattern, where I've got my, my input range, my begin and end for my input range, and then finally I've got the begin for my output range. And here, instead of iterators, I'm using pointers. I'm using pointers as iterators. So we're really just going to look at th these three functions. So how do we begin to construct this? Well, first, I've created an enumeration of character classes. So if you remember from the DFA, there were lots of character ranges. Well, there's only a limited number of those character ranges. In fact, there are 12 different character ranges. So I created an enumeration to represent each of those ranges. 
I also have enumerations that represent states. As you will recall, there were nine states, so there are nine values in the enumeration. Uh, the end state is the same as the begin state. And here I've also redefined lowercase error to make the transition table easier to read. Now, you may be wondering, why are these things incremented by 12 instead of 1? We'll get to that in a minute. So, data structures. When we're decoding a sequence of UTF-8 characters, the first byte in that sequence needs some special things done to it. It's treated differently than the continuation bytes. So, there's a, a very tiny data structure, first unit info, which uh, contains two bits of information. The first bit of information is, given this leading byte, what is the initial value of the code point based on this byte? What value based on this byte am I going to, this leading byte, am I going to assign to the code point? Secondly, what's the next state? If I get this input byte, and it's the first byte in the sequence, what's the next state? And then I've got my set of lookup tables, which I aligned on a page boundary for kicks. It requires 14 cache lines, uh, or 896 bytes. So I've got my, my, first, my first unit information for all possible 256 input bytes. I've got a map that maps an input byte to a character class. And finally, I've got my DFA transition table, which has 108, 108 entries in it. So, uh, at the bottom, so here's my definition of my tables, which are static. Here are three more important functions that we're going to examine. Advance, which actually works through the DFA, converting ASCII with SSE, and getting trailing zeros, which finds the trailing zeros in a word. So, let's look at our arrays. Our first array is mapping our first code unit to initial values. So, Here's just some chunks or some bits out of that array. So in my ASCII range here, if I've got the pound sign, which is hex 23, well, my code point is going to be hex 23, and I go back to the begin state, which is the done state. I've just recognized an ASCII character. If my initial byte is C3, well, this is in a two-byte sequence. I know that I'm going to mask off the lower five bits of C3, which means the initial bits I'm going to assign to the code point are three, and I'm going to go to continuation state 1. And similarly for uh, bytes which are in the F1, F, FO1, 1, 2, and 3 range, which represent four byte sequences. So that's, this table is used to determine what to do with the initial character in a sequence. Now I've got my character class table. So I've mapped uh, all of 256 values into a set of character classes. So you can see the first 128 are ASCII. From 8.0 to BF, I've got three different subranges, all of which represent continuation bytes, legal continuation bytes. Down in the bottom here in the red, those are bytes which can never occur in a sequence. And finally, in the light blue, the medium blue, and the dark blue, these are bytes which represent uh, two-byte sequences, leading two-byte sequence, leading for a three-byte sequence, and leading for a four-byte sequence. So, I can determine what, I mean, this is just uh, character compression, right? I'm, I'm compressing a character value into a character class. So, if we go back to the DFA and we take those ranges and we apply them to the DFA, here I've indicated which character class represents each transition. And the reason I want to do that is to make up my state transition table. So I have, I have nine states, and I have 12 character classes, which gives me 9 by 12 is 108 entries in this table. And the reason why the states are incremented by 12 is because this is actually a linear array. So I can take a state and a character class, and I can add them together and determine what is the next state when I do a lookup in that array. Any questions? Okay. So how does the conversion work? Well, let's start with the basic conversion algorithm. It's very simple. I've got my input iterators, my uh, begin and end iterators, and I've got a pointer to my output buffer. I'm going to store the beginning of my output buffer so I can determine how many code points I've sent. 
as long as I have input available to me, I'm going to call this function called advance, which is going to work its way through the DFA table. And as long as advance doesn't give me an error, I can keep decoding. So here's an overview. We're going to go through it in a little more detail uh, for purposes of, of, uh, of exp uh, exposition. Uh, we're going to declare some variables, we're going to handle the first character, and then we're going to loop over subsequent characters. So info is, represents the first character, unit represents the current UTF-8 code unit, type represents the character class for the current code unit, and cur represents the current DFA state. So let's look in the context of a problem. Let's go back to our sequence of E2, 88, 8, and 85. So we start with our code point has a value of zero. We're in the begin state of our DFA. Our look ahead character is E2. <coughs> and it looks like we're going to follow this transition to continuation state two. So we're going to look up the information from the first code point. We're going to get the first bits for the code point, the first value for the code point, and we're going to figure out what the next state is going to be, all because of this lookup. <coughs> So what do we get? Well, our look ahead is advanced to the next character. Our first byte was E2. It's the leading byte of a three byte sequence, so we're going to take the bottom four bits and we're going to put them into the bottom of our code unit. And we're going to advance to the next state, which is continuation state two. Now we're going to loop over the trailing bytes. I'm going to get the value of the current code unit. I'm going to adjust the code point. So I'm going to take the current value of the code point I'm going to shift it left by six bits. I'm going to take my current code bit, code unit. I'm going to mask off the lower six bits, and I'm going to bitwise or them onto the code point. I'm going to look up the code unit's character class, and given the value of the code unit and its type, I'm going to use the state plus the type to do a lookup in the transition table to determine the next state. So. I've consumed a character of look ahead. This is my current character. I've taken my four bits. I've shifted them left by six. I've stripped off the lower six bits of my second code unit, and I've put them here. And we're going to uh, move to continuation state one. And I'm going to repeat the process until I have decoded the entire sequence. My look ahead has moved behind. I've taken uh, my next six bits, I've shifted to the left by six and masked these in. And I've ended up back in the end state, or the begin state. But I have now recognized a sequence, and I've decoded the bits from that sequence to create a code point. I'm done. I will return the current state. And by the way, I've created, you can read this right off, a 2, 2, 0, 5, which corresponds to the empty set symbol, which is what lies between my ears most of the time. All right. And now that I've recognized a code point, I'm going to take that code point value and I'm going to insert it into my output array, my destination array. OK, how fast is this? Is it worth continuing? Here are some benchmarks. I'm not going to say much about them now. I'm going to come back to them. Uh, trust me, though, they are somewhat meaningful. I'm going to look at some examples from English, Chinese, and Hindi. And I'm going to compare it to some other libraries, iConv, the LLVM uh, transformation, uh, uh, transformation written by Alexei Vachenko, uh, let's see, stood code convert, uh, boost.txt, another DFA-based approach from a guy named Bjorn Herman. And by the way, I should say, I wish I was so smart that I had derived this DFA all by myself. In fact, after the fact, I found that someone else had actually built the same DFA about 10 years ago, a gentleman named Bjorn Herman. I have a reference to his work at the end of the talk. And uh, when I found it, I was happy that I found it, even though I'd already done all the work, because at least it confirmed that I was on the right track. So here we can see for sequences of all ASCII code units, we've got pretty good performance. I'm just slightly slower than Zach, which kind of bums me out a little bit because <laughs> Zach wrote boost text. You know, I'm a little bit bummed about that. 
However, when it comes to chi decoding Chinese text, I'm a little bit faster, so I'm happy about that. And when it comes to decoding Hindi, I'm a little bit faster as well. So the performance bump over things like ICON or LLVM or std co-convert, that's pretty reasonable. It's worth continuing. Can I get faster? Well, the answer is yes. I'm going to optimize. I'm going to do a very simple optimization for ASCII. Let's look at our basic algorithm again. What jumps out at you? Well, why do I have to call advance every time? If I have an ASCII character, I'm doing a lot of work here to recognize that I have an ASCII character. <laughs> I'm doing a table lookup, and I'm doing three assignments, all of which have to be done so that I can determine that I'm back in the begin state and I can exit from the advance function. Well, why don't I just look and see if the first byte is an ASCII byte? If it's an ASCII byte, I don't have to go into the DFA at all. I can just assign it directly to the output. Otherwise, if it's a non-ASCII byte, then I go into the DFA. Does this help? The answer is yes. Now, for English, for English text, I'm a good bit faster than Zach, which makes me very happy. <laughs> but the performance, you know, there's some speed up here for multi-byte character sequences, some non-trivial speed up. This is about 25% here. And this might be 20% here for Hindi, right? All right, that's pretty good. Can we go faster? Yes, we're going to optimize ASCII for ASCII using SSE intrinsics. <laughs> One of the things I noticed looking at the data is that anytime you have an ASCII character, it's very likely it's followed by one or more ASCII characters. We're going to optimize for that case. Alistair. When you optimize for ASCII, did you take that out of your tables to reduce your table size as well? No, I did not. Because the same table is being used for all three algorithms, and I didn't want to have two different tables. One table for the basic algorithm, and one table for ASCII optimized, and, to, and ASCII SSE optimized. Okay, let's look at our ASCII optimization, op optimized algorithm again. Wouldn't it be nice if instead of looking at one ASCII character at a time, if we found an ASCII character, we could do many ASCII characters at a time. So that's this for function, convert ASCII with SSE. And I'm going to take a pointer to my source and destination. And again, if my, my byte is not ASCII, I'm going to go into advance. And this is a little different up here, too. I'm using these SSE registers, which are 16 bytes long, and I, I, don't want to, I, I don't want to process the last 16 bytes with this. I don't know whether or not I'm actually going to have 16 bytes to consume. So the algorithm has two halves. The top half is consuming bytes using and optimizing using SSE, and the bottom half of the function, which is identical to the, basic, or the, the ASCII optimized algorithm, which is just for any trailing bytes that don't, that don't quite make it into an SSE register where I have 15 or fewer bytes, I'm going to use the regular, the regular ASCII optimized algorithm. How does this work? Well, this is too small to read. I'll go through it in more detail. I'm going to define some, some SSE registers, a couple of helper variables. I'm going to do some setup. And then I'm going to start unpacking bytes into 32-bit 30, into words. At the end of the day, in the bottom, I'm going to determine how far do I advance my source and destination pointers. Let's look <coughs> at an example. Suppose I have the 16 code units, which are Greek, Word, and I don't know how to pronounce this, but it's Kappa, Omicron, Sigma, Mu, Epsilon. These 16 code points, when, when encoded in UTF-8, create these 22 code units, right? So we're going to look at the first 16 code units. You'll notice that the first 11, if you count them, are ASCII. The last five are not ASCII. So keep that in mind. So I'm going to declare some SSE registers. Now, these are actually C structs. I think the compiler actually directly translates them into registers and applies register operations to them. But I don't know much about assembler. I can't say for sure. I've got a couple helper variables, which we'll, I will use to it, as, along the way. So the first thing I'm going to do is I have a register, which I'm going to fill with zeros. And I call the register zero. We're going to use this register to zero extend things. Now I'm going to do an unaligned load of 16 bytes from my source pointer into the register that I call chunk. So here's my memory, represented in gray. And here's my, by the way, the registers are in this dark blue. 
and I've done an unaligned load from memory into my register. And I'm going to call this other weird function move mask. Move mask is an intrinsic <coughs> in this particular invocation that finds octets that have their high bits set. If a high bit of an octet is set, that means it's not ASCII. That means it's 80 or higher. So here's my chunk register. I'm going to call this function. And by the way, I should say in all of these diagrams in this section, I'm going from least significant byte to most significant byte and least significant bit to most significant bit. So this is the least significant bit of this word. So this function is going to return 11, zero, 11 low, low order bit zeros followed by five ones. This is how later I'm going to detect that I can only advance my pointers by 11 instead of 16. So put that on the stack. All right. So now I'm going to start unpacking and zero padding things. So I've got my chunk register that's got my bytes in it. I've got my zero register. There are these unpack functions which take the contents of two registers and interleave them. So in this particular function, I'm taking the lower eight bytes of the zero register and the chunk register, and I am interleaving them inside a register I call half. I've effectively taken the lower eight bytes of, of my input data, and I've zero extended them to make eight 16-bit values. I'm going to repeat the process, except now I'm going to zero extend four of my 16-bit values by interleaving zeros to create four 32-bit values. And I put them in a register I call quarter. This is a quarter of the output data. This is half of the output data. I'm going to do an unaligned store into memory. So I've taken this, and now these are the words that I've written into memory, or the D, the D words, I should say. I'm going to repeat this process uh, for the upper half of my original input data write it to memory, and the process continues with the rest of the bytes. But it's really just interleaving zeros with uh, words to, to zero extend to get the 32-bit words that we want. And I'm doing this. All right, so I've written to memory. All right, now I've written a bunch of data to memory. I've taken uh, 16 bytes of input data. I've zero extend them to make 16 four byte D words of input data and I've written 64 bytes out into memory. But I know a priori in this case that I don't really want to advance my input pointer by 16 and I don't want to advance my output pointer by 16 D words because the last five values are not ASCII, right? So if no bits were set in the mask I knew that there would be 16 and that's easy. Otherwise, I need to count the trailing zeros that were in that mask word that I got at the beginning. So on Linux, with Clang and GCC, there's a nice intrinsic called built-in CTZ, which is uh, count trailing zeros. With Windows, it's called bit scan forward. It counts the number of, of zeros starting with the lowest bit, which is exactly what we need. So I get my trailing zeros. I returned 11 and I realized it was a bad choice because it was 1, 1 and I didn't mean binary, wow. so I wrote the word 11 there. So now I know <laughs> I can advance my source pointer by 11, which now points me at a non-ASCII byte, and I can take my destination pointer and I can move it by 11 D words. Now you might think, uh, I've wasted some work here, right? I've copied some stuff that I didn't need to copy. So falling out of the function, my next byte, I think, was CE. We'll go into the DFA, cycle through that as previously. So does it have any benefit? Well, when it comes to things that are largely ASCII, it has a lot of benefit. We're now six times faster than ICON. We are about five and a half times faster than ICON for Chinese. And for Hindi, we're about three times faster than ICON. I would say that's pretty reasonable performance speed up. So 
Now I'm actually going to jump into some benchmarks with a little more detail so that you know exactly what I was doing. So I was using an Ubuntu 1804 VM running on a Windows 10 Core i7, 3740, 2.7 gigahertz processor with 16 gig of RAM. I used GC7.2 and Clang 501. All the code was compiled minus 03 with the Westmere architecture flag. Yes, Peter? 32 or 64-bit? Uh, sorry, 64-bit. 60, all executables for this were 64-bit executables. Uh, on the same machine, which was running Windows, I ran natively uh, with Visual Studio 15.4.4, which is not quite the latest version, and with flags, which I am led to understand would give me optimum inlining and speed. My input data consists of nine input files, six of which were taken from wikipedia.org. Each of these files was, was English was easy. I looked up the, I, I typed the keywords English language in Wikipedia. I took the returned HTML and saved it as EnglishWiki.txt. For the other five, for example, Hindi, I did, typed in the Hindi language and saw the English translation of the Hindi language page. I then changed it to be the Hindi description of the Hindi language, which gave me more Hindi characters and saved that. So, this is the Wikipedia page that describes the Hindi language in the Hindi language, not in the English language. Yes, Alistair. Uh, yeah, that's the, how large these files are, are they kilobytes, megabytes? Yes, they range anywhere from 50 kilobytes to about 250. So, <coughs> English, Chinese, Hindi, Portuguese, Russian, and Swedish. For no particular, well, Chinese, Hindi, and Russian because they're three-byte sequences, Swedish, and Portuguese because they're mostly two-byte sequences. Then I have three stress tests, stress test zero, and it's zero because it's really not very stressful, which consists <laughs> of 100,000, 100,000 exactly ASCII code points, which means it was 100,000 code units. Stress test one, which was 100,000 Chinese code points, which gave me 300,000 code units, and stress test two, which was 50,000 Chinese code points interlaced with 50,000 ASCII code points, and if you do the math, that comes out to 200,000 code units, right? So 100K, 300K, 200K size files. And a little more about the libraries. Icon, this is libicon from GNU. I'm using it here as the gold standard because it's kind of universal. It works on anything. It has a lot more uh, transformations and encodings in it than just UTF-8 or UTF. LLVM, these are the UTF, -L UTF conversion functions which I took directly out of the LLVM distribution. They are exactly the same source code. AV, this is a UTF-8 to UTF-32 conversion function that's written by a gentleman named Alexei Vachenko. It is very much, it is very similar to that canonical example that, uh, that had an if-else ladder in it, so I included it for that reason. There's std code convert. There's boost.txt from Zach. And BH, again, this is an alternative DFA-based conversion by this gentleman I mentioned before named Bjorn Herrmann, uh, using code that he suggests in his article. And uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of transcoding to UTF-16, UTF where I'm going to compare to the multibyte to wide care function that's part of the Win32 API. And timings were gathered, as you would, might expect, by reading the input file, creating a buffer that I knew was bigger than needed to be for the output, starting a timer, entering the timing loop, performing conversion of the input buffer multiple times. And the number of times an input buffer was converted was determined by dividing one gigabit or one gigabyte by that size. In other words, for each language, I wanted to process one gigabyte of input for that type. So, if my file had 100,000 code units in it, it would be processed 10,000 times. If it had 200,000 code units in it, it would be processed 5,000 times. But at the end of the loop, I would have processed one gigabyte of input text. Exiting the timing loop, stopping the timer, collecting and collating information. At the end of the day, the output of every library for a given translation had to agree and be exactly the same as the output of every other library. <coughs>
So what do my results look like? Well, you've already seen this graph using GCC for English and Chinese and Hindi. For Portuguese and Swedish, you see that we, the relative performance for the SSE approach is sort of what it was for the English wiki, because there's a lot of ASCII in, those, in that file. Russian has a lot of three-byte sequences, and its performance is very similar to, uh, uh, to Chinese and Hindi. For the stress tests, well, of course, with nothing but ASCII to do, the SSE-based approach just flies, although Zach's approach is very, very respectable. <laughs> no, no, by me. Zach, Zach, Zach's code uses an if-else ladder, but he does it better than any of these other approaches. So, uh, sorry, Zach. I think that came out wrong. <laughs> oh, no. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so here's some interesting behavior, though, in stress test one. Remember, that was nothing but Chinese characters. So, the basic approach is actually faster because it doesn't spend time checking for ASCII characters. Every character must be decoded by using the DFA. And this gives us sort of an idea of what the overhead is of checking for ASCII ahead of time. Looks like it's about 2%. And you'll notice that the performance of the SSE-based approach is just a little bit slower. I'm not sure I know why that is because it should be performing exactly the same as the ASCII uh, optimized approach. For stress test two, where Chinese and ASCII characters were interlaced, we still get pretty reasonable performance about what we would expect with the DFA. Because there are ASCII characters, there's some optimization, and the ASCII optimized approach is a little faster. But the SSE approach just, just gets shot to hell. Because I'm starting up that sequence of code, I'm writing lots of stuff to memory, and then it turns out I only need one byte, or one code unit. Yes? So it was uniformly or yes, okay. yes. Uh, ASCII, Chinese, ASCII, Chinese. <coughs> and I've got some UTF-16 code uh, benchmarks here as well. Uh, here, uh, the AV approach is not there because he didn't have code for it, so I've left that blank so that the colors would remain the same. You can see that the performance for the SSE-based approach is a little bit faster because uh, I don't have to do as many instructions to unpack uh, data uh, in the, in the uh, SSE optimized function. But the relative performance is about the same. Uh, now, I think I had a comment about this, but I've forgotten what it was. All right. Okay. So let's look at how Clang performs. And what I found surprising was the difference in, in performance between Clang and uh, GCC. So Clang, uh, remember that when I'm calling icon, that's a, that's a pre-published library. I'm not compiling that. I'm just calling a library that already exists. But for things like LLVM, uh, Alexei Vachenko's code, std code convert, Boost text, uh, Bjorn Herman's code. I'm actually compiling that. Well, in some cases, Clang does a, a much worse job of generating code for that. But for the SSE case, it does a much better job, which I find kind of strange and surprising. We see similar patterns here for Portuguese, Russian, and Swedish. Um, but again, what surprises me is how much slower. Uh, the Clang compiled code, especially for the LLVM converter, <laughs> is, uh, you know. Uh, and the stress test. Now, this is something very odd, and, and Zach and I have been talking about this for a few days now. Uh, with boost text, Clang is generating extraordinarily bad code for some reason. There's no way to explain this big performance delta. I, I can't explain it. I don't understand why it is. And Zach and I were sitting in the airport yesterday and uh, discussing this, and he was able to confirm the same results on his laptop. I have no explanation for it, uh, other than it's, you know, it's surprising. But the performance in the stress tests is similar. Of course, you can see here that I've got much faster ASCII gen uh, generation. And uh, I see similar uh, 
a similar difference here where the basic approach is slightly faster for all Chinese characters. Uh, but what surprises me here with Clang is, is that, um, yes, never mind. Uh, so I have similar performance here as with GCC, and again, similar performance characteristics in stress test two, which is the interleaved Chinese and ASCII characters. And I ran through the same exercise with UTF-16 to confirm that the performance behavior that you see across these different languages uh, is similar. There are not really many surprises here. Uh, <laughs> All right, so uh, with Windows, the graphs looked a little bit different. And again, the, the performance with boost.txt, really that, that strange performance was, was on the two stress tests, stress test one and stress test two. Uh, in, the other, in the other tests, the, the boost.txt performance in Clang was in line with what you would expect it to be. So it's, it's really a mystery to me why the performance on those tests was not what we thought it ought to be. So here uh, under Windows, we see very similar uh, performance characteristics between the, the basic and the ASCII optimized and the SSE optimized uh, performance. But what I really wanted to get to with Windows was UTF-16. Of course, on Windows, uh, internally in the kernel and in the file system, things it uses UTF-16. If you pass a Windows API function, something that's, uh, that, a, that takes a string that's a char star, it will internally convert it to uh, UTF-16 before it actually does something with it. And so it provides this uh, multi-byte to wide character API function, which is actually quite fast. And uh, I was really only able to beat that function with the SSE optimized version of the algorithm. So here, uh, where the AV algorithm would be, because I don't have that for UTF-16, I've substituted multi-byte to wide character on Windows for UTF-16. And so my objective here was to have at least one of my algorithms for every data set be faster than multi-byte to wide character. And for the most part, I succeeded, uh, except for stress test one, which was all Chinese characters. Here, I was consistently beaten by multi-byte to wide character, although by a relatively small amount, about 3%. So I'm pleased that by using the, the basic DFA-based approach, I can come so close to something which is a black box and has probably been, uh, presumably been optimized over the years by programmers who make a lot more money than I do. Uh, but the performance uh, was pretty pleasing. And in every case, I was able to select, I was able to provide a function that is at least, is almost as fast or faster than multi-byte to wide character. So I know someone's going to ask the question, how does Clang and GCC compare to each other? So I took the same data, uh, recollated it to create graphs that compare Clang and GCC performance. So the way to look at this, these graphs is, I hope you can see there are, there are bars, gray and white bars, <coughs> and inside each vertical bar are two, uh, two values. The one on the left is the time with GCC that required by GCC, and the time on the right is, th is the time value that was given with the Clang produced executable. So you can look at each bar and you can kind of get a feeling that for this data set and this a given data set and library, how did GCC perform relative to Clang? So for example, with iConv, which is just a library that's pre-provided, the, the performance for GCC and Clang was very close. I mean, you know, less than a percent difference. For LLVM, using the LLVM converter with GCC and Clang, you can see that Clang was a little bit slower with its own converter. Uh, I hope nobody that works on that is watching this. Okay, uh, same thing with Alexei Vachenko's code. The Clang generated code is worse, but if we look at, let's see, std code convert, 
Clang does pretty respectable. Now, I don't know if that's Howard's std code convert implementation or whether in this case uh, Clang is doing a better job of optimizing. Here in the middle is the boost dot, uh, in all of these graphs in the middle is the boost dot text and you can see that, you know, very good results with GCC but Clang is not nearly as good. And then finally, uh, GCC and Clang performance for the basic approach, the ASCII optimized approach, and the SSE optimized approach. And again, this is something I found very surprising was this difference here. Why the Clang code gen should be so much faster than GCC is, uh, is a mystery to me. Peter. Um, I see that there's a difference between std.convert on GCC and on Clang. Yes. Clang supports two standard libraries. Ah. Yes. <coughs> Which of those did you use? The same one as on GCC or as none? Because that might explain a completely different implementation beneath it. You know what? I think I'm going to have to walk back that comment. I think I compiled this with libstud C++ for both. So they are comparable? Yes, they are comparable. Thank you for pointing that out. I, I, made a mis uh, I misspoke earlier. Uh, for the Hindi wiki, which has got a lot of three-byte sequences in it, you can see the, the, the performance gaps tend to tighten up. Same thing with Russian. Stress test zero. Again, you see a performance gap widening here inexplicably for uh, boost.txt. And again, a big performance gap <coughs> for the LLVM decoder. Stress test one and stress <laughs> test two. Okay. Any questions about those results? Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Does it? Okay. Hey, one thing though. The DA you got, you're in something. The you're in Harriman. Why is he much slower than yours? I don't know. I used, I took, so he has a web page which I reference <coughs> and I basically cut and pasted code out of his web page and, and used his suggested implementation without trying to optimize what he did. On his web page, he also mentions, an op he describes how an optimization could be done with his code, but he doesn't provide it. I tried to follow his steps to do the optimization, was unsuccessful. So I just took the code that appeared on his web page, cut and pasted it into, into, into test files, and also inlined his function that does the DFA recognition so that it would be similar to my DFA recognizer, which is also inlined. I cannot explain this performance gap. Yes? Um, so in your SSE optimized code, uh, uh, have you considered looking at the mask after you evaluate it and using that to decide uh, how, many, how many quarters to copy? Yes. I actually did try that. And not doing that evaluation is faster. By simply assuming that I can I'm going to zero extend all 16 bytes and taking the words and blasting them into memory mm -hmm. turns out to be faster than trying to, pre to, to detect ahead of time how many I'm going to need to write. Well, I think the probably except in the worst stress case. Except in the worst stress. In the worst stress case, that, that would have worked very well. But uh, in general, for the other uh, data sets, it did not. Alistair. A uh, variation on that would be for just to avoid pessimizing the Chinese case. Uh, did you try doing the ASCII test on the first byte before going into the SSE version versus dropping straight down and therefore avoiding all that redundant work on a pure Chinese text? Yes, well, the, the, SSE, the SSE approach does look to see if the first character is ASCII and if it is not, it, it's, it bypasses the SSE approach. I missed that then, sorry. Yeah. I thought we always did the SSE and then got, we, we t consumed zero bytes and then did the... Well, it did do a pre tag before it went into the SSE loop. Yeah, uh, okay. I, I am interested in the, the corollary of your question, which is if you have Chinese uh, words separated by spaces, mm -hmm. that might be its own worst case. As in, every time you go into the SSE loop, you do one byte for a space. Yeah. Then you go back into the other loop, uh, then you do another do they, loop for a single space. Do they do spaces in Chinese? Good question. Uh, I think I know. Yeah, so Alistair, to answer your question, here's the pre-check for ASCII yeah, before... Yeah. Yes, okay. Maybe. So in which case, my, my follow-up would be, did you check to see if they could 
as part of your SSE, you, you, you at the end you say how many characters you like in the queue. <coughs> Did you try putting a quick check with that up front to say if that's a really small number, skip straight out? So say if I'm going to consume two or three characters, I might want to try skipping out and seeing if that cleans up your worst cases yes. without costing too much. I understand what you said, and that's an interesting test that I did not try. All right, let me see if I can get back to where I was. Okay, so some parting thoughts. So, as I said, this is code that I wrote to sort of prove a point and determine whether or not this is an approach that could be useful uh, in the real world. So there is no error handling in it. It's intentionally limited. The interface is intentionally small and limited to pointers for the moment. There are actually two different table-based advanced, al advanced algorithms, the, 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 the function that advances through the DFA. There's the big table approach, which is the one that we discussed today, which takes 14 cache lines of data. And there's the small table approach, which only requires six cache lines of data. The difference between the two is that deals with how that first byte is handled. In the big table approach, I'm using a table to decide what to do with the first byte. In the small table approach, I'm treating that byte very similarly to the way that I would in a traditional decoder. So there's actually more bitwise operations that are going on there, and it is slightly slower than the big table approach, typically 4 to 5% slower. So how would you reuse this library? Well, at some point in the very near future, I'm going to publish this as a library on GitHub, and I would expect people to be able to use it as a library off the shelf. But I also think for something like this, it may be in someone's best interest, if they're really looking for the ultimate in speed, is to do cut and paste. I can't provide or, or, or think in advance uh, of all the possible, of the interface that best solves your problem or the error handling that you want to perform to solve your particular problem. So I've tried to write this in such a way that if one was so inclined, one could cut out the tables and the, and the functions and put them in something else, rename them, and, and just make it work. So there's only a trivial mechanism at the moment for reporting errors. I'm not doing any checking for null pointer arguments. I'm assuming that my input and output pointers refer to buffers that really exist. I'm assuming that my destination buffer is big enough to rec receive all of the characters I'm gonna, or code points I'm going to write into it with no overflow. The fact that I'm using SSE, and this has got a, an Intel heritage, means that my output currently is little endian decoding only. And there are uh, officially defined little endian and big endian UTF representations. So, of course, this sort of tells you, well, what needs to be done in the future? Well, <coughs> providing conversions to little endian and big endian representations on the tail end of each write to a, just before the write to a destination buffer. And there are, you know, assembly instructions or intrinsics that will do that for you in a single operation. I should, provide, I should provide a validate member function that will check the validity of an input sequence of UTF-8 and measure its length in code points, analogous to STIRLAN. I should provide member function templates that actually take iterators instead, in addition to working with pointers. So I could use input and output iterators uh, with, the, with a non-error handling version of the BASIC and the ASCII optimized algorithms. Uh, any sort of error handling where you would want to back up and determine the beginning of an invalid sequence could not be done with input and output iterators. So any, uh, I think they could only work with, with a decoder that either doesn't handle errors or has very primitive error handling. On the other hand, if I use forward iterators, then I could write reasonably powerful error handling, error, error reporting, and error handling for the basic and ASCII optimized algorithms. And then finally, 
If I'm using pointers or random access iterators, which I know point to contiguous storage, uh, I could use those with all three algorithms. If I don't know that I'm pointing to contiguous storage, I obviously cannot use the SSE-based approach. Alistair. So you can use the SSE-based approach by reading in front into a small buffer and then using your SSE approach on that small buffer. Yes, I could do that, uh, which would mean more time. So one could write, one could write an algorithm that does exactly that uh, for the appropriate uh, category of iterator. Well, what, yeah, so when you're working with non-random access iterators, I think that would be worth investigating. Yes. Uh, the versions of the functions I saw that I showed you are similar to std copy in that there are three argument versions, the input range and the beginning or the output range. Well, as part of doing validation, it would be nice to have four argument versions of that, so uh, for the case of random access iterators or pointers, so that I can make sure that my output buffer is appropriately sized. Uh, a use, uh, another useful thing would be able to provide meaningful error reporting, being able to tell you whether or not you have uh, gone past, you've run out of characters and you've not finished the decoding, or you've, you're in danger of overflowing your output buffer, or if you have encountered an overlong sequence, or if you have encountered an illegal byte, or if you've just encountered garbage, right? These are all things that, with appropriate error checking after the fact, could be reported to the user. What kind of error did you have and where did it occur? But there are also error recovery strategies that could be employed. You could stop and either return an error code or just return or throw an exception immediately when you find an error in the input sequence. Uh, you could choose to skip all of the defective sequences until you find a code unit sequence that is valid, effectively throwing out information from your input sequence. You could replace defective ranges of code units with some, some other character. Uh, sometimes you see on web pages or in editors or things you'll see, I think it's the question mark character. Uh, that is a substitution character, meaning an invalid UTF-8 sequence has been encountered and because we don't know what to do, we're going to put in this other character which indicates there was a problem here. These are three strategies that people use. There are probably more. So thinking about error handling and going back to the basic algorithm, and all the algorithms follow the same pattern. Once an error has been detected, we drop down into this branch. And this is the point where you could call a function. This is in the slow path. You could call a function. You could pass it all of the information that you have and make a determination about exactly what error occurred. If you had a four argument version of the function, you could also pass in the input range, the output range, and the current state, and with that information, determine what exactly happened. And uh, because you have the, the full output range, you could possibly also decide to write substitution characters or something else into the output data stream. So in summary, Sometimes it pays to re-examine the algorithms and data structures that you use to solve a problem. Uh, I think I got lucky this time. Don't try too hard to outsmart the compiler. It's already pretty smart, except in some Clang cases that we saw. Uh, I spent way too much time changing the order of branches and if statements and, and trying all kinds of little tweaks that the compiler just ignored. Uh, I would say that 75% of the time I spent trying to optimize this code was useless because the compiler was just saying, I see that code, Bob. You can't fool me. I know what you really mean, and I'm going to do it this way. Build benchmarks and test and test and test and test some more. After I wrote the initial simple decoder, I built this, the first set of benchmark code, uh, which evolved over time. But <coughs> It's not sufficient to just test and test and test in one place. You need to try it with multiple compilers. Here I used three. On multiple operating systems, here I used two, Windows and Linux. Uh, 
Uh, if I'd had a free BSD VM up and running, I would have tried that as well. On multiple hardware platforms, I only showed you results for one hardware platform. Those performance graphs change across different, different chips. The old Xeon Westmere that I have on my desktop at home has different performance characteristics than the Core i7 workstation that I have at work, which is different than the Core i7, which is in this laptop, which is different than the Core i7 that my wife has in her office at home. Right? The performance characteristics of those chips were all different. Uh, so it pays to look across a bigger universe, or the multiverse, if you will, to truly understand if you are really getting real performance gains when you try to optimize. And finally, like I said, I think I got lucky. I caught a big fish. It doesn't happen to me very often, so I would say savor your victories. Because I don't know about you, but this kind of you know, victory doesn't occur for me very often. So it was some very nice results, and I'm very pleased with them. Here are some references. These are references uh, for all of the things that I used here, except I've forgotten to include a link to Alexei Vachenko's code. I will correct that and add that to the final version of this PowerPoint. Finally, we've got a couple minutes left. Any more questions that I can answer? Jeff. So on the error handling, could you not build those different error states actually into the DFA so that you would expect the, the performance would pretty much be the same, right? I mean, I tried that and it doesn't work. The DFA and the code for iterating over the DFA is the minimal code that I could write or the code that I could write with the maximum speed and doing anything else in order to save an error condition or a location slowed it down. So my thinking was if I detect, the, if I, if I detect an error state, then I'm going to move into the slow path of the function and I'm going to give it all the information that I have and then I'm going to back up until I find a valid UTF-8 sequence. And then I'm going to move forward until I find the invalid one. And then I'm going to figure out what happened. I want all of that work to be done on the slow path because in that tight loop, in iterating over the DFA, I don't want to do anything more than what I've shown you. Other questions? Peter. Um, you um, basically made a UTF-8 to UTF-16 and 32 in Fast Little Library. And you try to make it really fast. Yes. And when you look at future directions, there's no mention of making it faster. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> I'd be an thank you. Th thank you for pointing out that oversight. <laughs> uh, so uh, I have, there is, it occurred to me recently that as I mentioned before, there are two different approaches. I've only discussed one, the big table approach. There's the small table approach, which was my original approach. And my attention was that, hey, if somebody was writing something for an embedded device and they could spare 380 bytes for tables, this might work. And I looked at it and said, well, most of the guys I know and most of the applications I use are not in embedded devices. And maybe we could have a table that's bigger. So we can spare 876 bytes for the tables there. But then it occurred to me that uh, maybe uh, for part of that inner loop, I could create another lookup table that has got some pre-computed results in it. Pre-computed results for those bit masking operations. And I might be able to squeeze one or two more percent out of that. I haven't tried it yet. That's, a, that's something I'm going to try. And I'm going to call that the jumbo table because it basically is the big table approach uh, and then adding another table for lookups inside the loop. Uh, but there are also, now there are intrinsics for AVX 512. I don't know if those can be used for applications like this, and I thought if I ever have some spare time, I would look and see if that might, be, that might work. Because it would sure be sweet if you could work with 64 bytes at a time instead of 16. I don't know if, if intrinsics exist that would allow you to do that, but if they do, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, that has a big downside that only the big server-side CPUs have those instructions. And if you use them a lot, they uh, basically slow down the entire CPU to a very base clock speed. So using that one part of your code will slow down all the other parts. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. Somebody tried to use that to make things faster, and in the end, 
making that part faster made it faster, but made everything else so much slower that there was no point. Okay. Um, did you look at any kind of hardware measurements, like performance counters, to see what's currently the limit of performance? I did not. Closest to hit? I did not. I purely conducted timings. That might be a, an idea to investigate. Yes. Okay. So finally, thank you, but uh, I this morning published the code, all of the supporting code, and a PDF for this talk on, on, on GitHub under uh, CPP Now 2018. As I said, the supporting code, which is, is there now, I'm going to add some to it, and within a few days, I'm going to publish it under this URL on GitHub. So if you want to use something that's got a little bit more to it, you can look there. And finally, I'll throw in a shameless, blog for my, or a shameless plug for my blog. So thank you, everybody, for coming. I hope you found it useful.